Members, it is now time for question time. And on this occasion, it's questions to the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. And we will start with listed questions. Can I advise members that questions number five and seven have been withdrawn? I call Mr. Sam Gardner. Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, question number one. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Jennifer McCann to answer this question. In remaining committed to eradicating harmful and unjustifiable age discrimination, we developed a consultation document to seek public views on proposals to extend age discrimination legislation. The consultation closed in October last year, and there was a significant response to this consultation, and officials are currently finalising a comprehensive analysis of the responses to each of the consultation questions to provide us with an overall picture of the views emerging from the consultation process. While many people welcomed our proposals, the responses were also present a number of fundamental challenges. We want to consider those responses carefully and make sure that we have agreed a clear and robust policy position before considering all the options available to us for bringing this legislation before the Assembly. I call Mr Sam Gardner for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I do thank the Minister for her, her uh, reply thus far. But could the Minister provide us with an update as to the legal complaint from the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People? NICCY, complaining about the way OFM, DFM have conducted the consultation process. Well, I can, I, I can confirm to um, the member that on the 21st of October um, last year, the Children's Commissioner's Office launched a section, uh, pre, section 75 pre-complaint letter with OFM, DFM. The department then issued a response to that letter. And they then lodged a formal Section 75 complaint in respect of an alleged failure to comply with the Department's Equality Scheme in its consultation on HGFS. And really, you know, then it is now up to the Equality Commission then to decide on whether they investigate that complaint or not. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Alliance Party supports the extension of anti-age discrimination legislation to all ages. So, can I ask the junior minister uh, what, uh, the, in her assessment, are the key reasons that OFM DFM will fail to deliver legislation to protect older people from discrimination in the delivery of goods, facilities, and services, as was committed in the programme for government? The member will be aware, and we've had a, a number of meetings with the member and with the OFM DFM committee on this issue. And you know that was the why we went out to consultation was to find out what people actually um, thought of the, the position that we, we were we were taking. I have said in my previous answer that there have been fundamental issues that have been emerging from you know the responses to that consultation, and uh, with the children's commissioner and indeed the children's law centre. Um, being involved in um, taking that uh, a formal Section 75 uh, alleged failure to comply with, with the Department's equality scheme. We are now left in a position where we are looking at the, the consultation responses um, before we come forward with any policy, um, robust policy decision on that. I call Alex Maskey. Uh, thank you. Last comment, Kola. Can I ask the Minister, um, to, first of all, thank them for responses so far, but could I ask the Minister, could they elaborate further on any specific issues which have been raised uh, in the consultation? Well, just, just again, uh, in my previous responses, there has, uh, while there, there seemed to be that the, the, the legislation in this area that we were bringing forward was broadly welcomed by respondents to the consultation, there were, as I said, a number of fundamental challenges as well. Um, one from the Commissioner of Children and Young Peoples, which I have already expressed that their disappointment that the exclusion of those uh, young people under 16 from the scope of any proposed legislation, and that was indeed echoed by other organisations and individuals. There was also uh, a number of respondents expressed disappointment at the proposed exemption to allow financial service providers to continue the, to use age as part of a risk assessment as well. Um, so there, there are fundamental challenges there for us when we're bringing that, uh, that forward in terms of we need to listen to what all those organisations and individuals have said. I call Claire Sugden. 
Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I, for one minute, don't believe that the Department had any intention on moving this legislation before the end of the mandate. I think it's a disgrace because we're failing a significant part of our uh, society by not doing so. So will the Junior Minister, on behalf of the Department, uh, put on record their commitment to, to move this legislation as soon as possible into the new mandate? I certainly will put that on record, yes. Moving on, I call John Dallet. Question at all. Question number two. Uh, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. We have allocated £2.1 million to the Strategic Investment Board for the delivery of the Urban Villages programme in 2015-16. This funding covers staffing costs for the SIB team and revenue funding for scoping and early engagement work in each urban village. These activities include capacity building, working with children and young people, and a series of creative and educational projects being taken forward by organisations such as the National Museums, Libraries NI, NI Screen, and the Armagh Observatory and Planetarium. The Urban Village team is currently undertaking a programme of engagement within each of the five urban villages, and stakeholder engagement workshops are taking place until next month. The outcome of this engagement will be the creation of an integrated development framework for each urban village, which will detail the capital and revenue projects identified from the extensive stakeholder engagement. I call John Dallet. Speaker, the Minister will no doubt be aware that in a couple of weeks' time, the members of this Assembly will be going to the hustings to give an account of themselves. Does the Minister seriously believe that enough has been done to build our communities? And given that only one peace wall is in the shape of falling. Surely, this really has been cooked in a darkened room. Well, I'm, I'm not really sure what the member's question supplementary is, but I mean, certainly I have, I have indicated to him the amount of money that has been spent in urban villages thus far, and you know, even in, in the, the member's um, uh, own constituency, in the, well, not the, your constituency, but in your immediate area in terms of the, the one in Derry, the Bogside and the Fountain. There has been quite a lot of work already done there also. I think that, that really, you know, I mean, we have did this. We have also brought money forward through the uh, Social Investment Fund into communities as well. So I think that there has been a lot of investment uh, in terms of, of the community infrastructure. And indeed, you know, I mean, I, I have seen it firsthand some of the work that, that those uh, strategic investment fund and the Together Building United Communities uh, money has actually provided. I was at uh, a seminar last two weeks ago on Saturday where we saw hundreds of young people who took part in the United Youth Programme and in the summer camps all coming together, um, meeting, some of them meeting uh, people from other community, from uh, a different community for the first time ever in their lives, you know, coming together and, and building friendships, building relationships and hopefully building, uh, making them uh, a lifetime relationship and, and go on to reconciliation. So I see a lot of work that has been done, particularly through this particular strategy. I call Gregory Campbell. Hey, Principal, Deputy Speaker, the um, Junior Minister referred to work being done in various areas, in, including London Derry. But is she able to give the House and the wider community any idea of where she would see the community across Northern Ireland being, say, in five years' time at the end of the next Assembly mandate after the Together Building a United Community uh, programme has had a chance to roll out? Well, I mean, obviously, as I said in, in my previous answer, uh, I have been speaking directly myself and the, uh, the other junior minister um, go, have been got out. We have spoken directly, particularly to the young people from the United Youth Programme and from the summer camps. And we have spoken to people in the urban villages who, um, you know, uh, in terms of going to be insured housing and insured education. So I would like to see, I would like to think that in the next mandate that work would be taken forward. I think it's very, very um, important work. I think particularly for young people in, in our community, we need to be showing leadership. We need to be showing the way forward for people to come together. Um, we, we've, we've built the peace, but now we need to build the reconciliation. So I would be hopeful that that would continue with the Together Building a United Community as a, a strategy. And it's not the only strategy. There's other, there's other things there that needs to be done as well. I think it is about basing it on equality, and it's about basing it on equality of opportunity for all our children and our young people, particularly. I call Bronwyn McGahan. 
Question three. Uh, the proposed uh, referendum date is Thursday, the 23rd of June. This will leave just uh, six weeks between the Assembly election and the EU referendum. A considerable part of the referendum campaign will run in parallel with our local elections, uh, and there is a lot at stake, and clarity is needed to fully explore the implications of staying in or leaving the European Union. Uh, we would have pre preferred that the debate leading up to the referendum be kept free of all our campaigning distractions. In a joint letter with the First Ministers of Scotland and Wales, we made our concerns known to the Prime Minister. Tomorrow, the First Minister and I uh, will press the Foreign Secretary, whenever we meet with him in London, for an informed public debate on the referendum conducted in commonplace language that is uh, clearly understood by all. A call from McGann for supplementary. Gormiogat and I, I thank the Minister for his response. What damage does the Minister feel uh, would result from an exit from the EU? Well, I think this is obviously going to be uh, a huge debate over the course of the next uh, number of weeks and indeed uh, months. And uh, different people talk about us if there was a decision to exit Europe. Uh, effectively walking into the unknown. But the, the reality for us is that we have received significant support from the European uh, Union, uh, and uh, we would lose access, for example, to structural funds, which were something in the region of 982 million over the period 2014 to 2020. Uh, and that makes up things like the uh, European Regional Development Fund, uh, Interreg, Peace 4, European Social Fund. Common agri agricultural policy uh, funding, which was worth approximately 2.5 billion in 2014-2020, a loss of access to competitive EU funding, which in the four years from 2011 to 2012 to 2014-15 amounted to 95 million pounds. So, I mean, there are uh, implications. I'm, I'm always very conscious whenever we have to answer questions of this nature in the assembly, particularly from a perspective of the Office of First and Deputy First Minister, that there will be times when there's differences of opinion about how we uh, should answer the question. And I say that respectful of the positions of all our parties, uh, like, like, for example, the DUP and the Assembly. Everybody is obviously entitled to their own position in regard to the, this particular debate. So uh, th this is from my perspective, if you like, that my sense of it is that we would lose out considerably in terms of our farming community, in terms of our business community, and in terms of the work that's going on in our universities. And obviously, a lot of parties in the Assembly have expressed their opinions, and we're awaiting with interest what the Ulster Unionists have to say. But I mean, it's going to be a big debate in the time ahead. I call Alex Atwood. Deputy Speaker, uh, would, you, would the first, or would the first minister agree with me that the fact that the Prime Minister was here in Northern Ireland at the weekend demonstrated that the votes of people in Northern Ireland are going to be critical come the June referendum? And in that regard, as things stand, it seems that many farmers, many in small and medium enterprises, many in the CBI, and many in the community and voluntary sector indeed a critical mass of people in Northern Ireland are very clearly in favour of staying in Europe. Well, I, I, I think that the, the member is, uh, is correct. Uh, I think that there is uh, uh, no doubt that, uh, it's certainly my view, that the strength of opinion here in the North among the business community, farming organisations, community and voluntary sector, the universities, educational establishments, and of course the majority of parties in the Assembly uh, are, are forced in, in Europe. Uh, we, we did have uh, David Cameron here at, at the weekend, and we had Boris Johnson here this morning, and the First Minister and I met with him uh, in what was a good news story in terms of the £62 million uh, investment into uh, 200 more right buses, which is employing and securing jobs of 300 people for the next uh, short while. But obviously, during the course of our uh, visit to, to Antrim this morning, uh, the media were very uh, focused on uh, the fact that he was here and his views and, and opinions. And 
He was asked about it, the First Minister was asked about it, I was asked about it, and uh, we, we all stated uh, our positions. But, I mean, I, I'm in the stay in camp. I think that the damage done to ourselves in the north and to the island of Ireland by any exit uh, from, from Europe, uh, that, that the case for staying in is just so compelling when you look at the numbers of organisations here in the north and indeed the political parties that are uh, in favour of staying in. So, I do believe when the vote is, is had that uh, a majority, overwhelming majority, will vote to stay. I call Kieran McCarthy. Mr. <coughs> Deputy Speaker, uh, can I ask the Deputy First Minister, given the obvious snub and rejection by the British Prime Minister on your request and the First Minister's request for a meeting to uh, postpone the, the, um, the um, date of the referendum, and of course the Scottish and Welsh. Do you, does the Deputy First Minister not regard his request for another meeting that he will be uh, snubbed once again? Well, the, the meeting that the First Minister and I are attending is one in London tomorrow with the Foreign Secretary. And uh, obviously the joint letter that we sent with Wales and Scotland uh, wasn't uh, favourably received uh, by the Prime Minister, who appeared hell-bent in going ahead with the referendum uh, in June. But the day is cast, and uh, what we obviously now have to deal with is the ongoing uh, debate that there will be over the course of that period. And uh, there is a very real danger, given the fact that the, the, the debate will be headed up uh, and what will probably be a punch and duty show between the British Prime Minister and uh, Boris Johnson. So that debate will continue over the course of uh, the next uh, number of months. And it's a very important debate because the implications, in my view, of uh, an exit from Europe for us in the north and on the island of Ireland are very, very profound indeed. I call Jim Allister. Uh, leaving aside the novelty of the Deputy First Minister and Sinn Féin campaigning on a Brits in platform. Does the um, Deputy First Minister at least acknowledge that every penny that we receive back from Europe is but some of our own money coming back to us? Because we in this nation, United Kingdom, are a huge net contributor. Does he acknowledge that fact? I, I do acknowledge that over the course of uh the recent times, all sorts of figures have been bandied about in order to reinforce certain individuals' argument. Uh, what I am arguing is very, very clear and very, very simple, that I believe that any exit from Europe would be hugely detrimental to our farmers, to our business community, to our educational establishment, to the community and voluntary sector, and to the island of Ireland as a whole. So my interest in this debate is what's good for every one of Ireland's 32 counties, including the six that reside here in the north. I call Edwin Putz. For Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the sustainability of the local economy is the core of our programme for government. Uh, it is important to recognise that in the face of a global economic collapse, the executive has succeeded in growing our economy since 2011. Over 40,000 new jobs have been created over the last five years, with almost 10,000 in the last year alone. Retaining these jobs and continuing to attract new opportunities continues to be a priority, especially in the light of the devastating recent news at Bombardier. Next month, the First Minister and I will visit the United States. We will use the opportunity to promote local businesses and the advent of a reduced corporation tax at a series of meetings with prospective investors on the east and west coast. Our itinerary will include one-to-one -one meetings with senior executives from companies across a full range of sectors, including two major speaking opportunities to CEO-level contacts in New York and Silicon Valley, California. We have taken a long-term view on promoting our position with targeted regions around the world. The establishment of bureaus in Washington, D.C., Brussels and Beijing is a clear signal of the Executive's commitment to this strategy. 
Through their work in collaboration with InvestNA, I am confident we will continue to attract further foreign direct investment and new jobs. Michael Redenputz. Uh, does the Deputy First Minister recognise um, that quality uh, people are a key aspect to selling ourselves internationally, and therefore training and universities are of huge importance? And what commitment can he give that um, the universities and training sector, which has uh, come under huge pressures over the course of the last uh, two years in particular, will uh, be given the support that they need uh, to give the international investors uh, that quality workforce so that local people, um, ordinary working class people uh, who currently don't have jobs, will be trained and uh, well placed to receive these jobs? Well, I absolutely agree with the member that in the context of what has been a very successful five, six year period where the previous First Minister and myself travelled extensively to the United States along with the then Deputy Minister, now the First Minister, to, uh, to successfully bring more foreign direct investment to the North. Uh, than at any other time in the history of the state, which was a remarkable achievement given that we did this in the context of a world economic downturn. But the member is correct. If we are to continue to be successful, particularly in the context of uh, a lower rate of corporation tax, it is vitally important that we support our educational establishments so that, that we are producing uh, the numbers of people with the right skills to take advantage of the opportunities that will clearly be presented. So the First Minister and I are very focused on this issue. Uh, obviously in the aftermath of the uh, Assembly elections with the reduction in the number of departments from 12 to 9. Uh, we are amalgamating the Department of uh, Enterprise, Trade and Investment with the Department for Employment and Learning. And I think that sends a very clear signal as to the uh, need to ensure a joined-up approach to attracting foreign direct investment but providing the potential investors with the skills that uh, they require. Well, we just lost the lesson, uh, lesson last Kedar, and my, my thanks to the Deputy First Minister for his answers as well. Uh, Deputy First Minister, you mentioned uh, the importance of the U.S. You head to the U.S. shortly. I was in New York at the weekend, and you'll be happy to know that our friends in business and Irish-American politics are looking forward to your upcoming visit. I'm too diplomatic to say that they're more interested in the fact that the First Minister will be making her first visit as Remember First Minister, but question, perhaps you can tell us the importance of that visit and, of course, your, your trip to the West Coast. Thank you. Well, as I've said in the previous answer, I mean, First Minister and I absolutely appreciate the contribution that North America has made and, and the support that we have received. And, and of course, I'm, particularly delighted that uh, Drew O'Brien from the, sta the State Department will arrive later this week with a very high-powered delegation of uh, people who are looking at the uh, potential opportunities. Uh, and when you consider that the vast bulk of our foreign direct investment has come from the U.S., obviously uh, meeting with uh, potential investors uh, in the United States is very, very important. The, the, the whole conversation around corporation tax is obviously a vital one given that there will be uh, intense interest and whenever the previous First Minister and I uh, on the occasions that we were in the United States over the course of uh, many years had conversations with uh, some of the most high profile business people in the world the question of our continuing involvement in Europe always came up so no, no doubt that's going to be a feature of the conversation when we, when we go there but I, I still think that the First Minister and I have a very compelling case to make in relation to the, uh, the, the potential opportunities that are there, not just for potential investors, but for ourselves in terms of getting our young people into employment, which is a, a vital consideration for all of us as we move forward. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Speaker, and uh, the, the, the Deputy First Minister will, I'm sure, agree with me that when international investors are looking to uh, locate here, they want to look at quality of life, life issues as well and the availability of public services. So will the Deputy First Minister join with me in calling for greater investment in our public services, both across health and indeed education, as these are key factors uh, that investors look to whenever they are uh, looking to establish a business here in the North? 
I, I, I do agree with the member. It, it, is, it is absolutely vital that uh, quality of life has an impact on those who come here to explore uh, potential investment in uh, this part of the world. Uh, and education is obviously critical in all of that. And that's why, in the course of uh, uh, our visit to the United States and what we think will be the returns from that visit, which obviously we hope will be considerable, given that we have predicted that if, on the basis of affordability, we can reduce corporation tax to 12.5%, then our estimation is that we can create something like between 30 and 35, 37,000 new jobs. And that's absolutely vital in terms of employment for our young people and for those who are presently out of work. Now, I think that as we, as we go forward, we, we have to deal with the challenges that an increased uh, interest in potential investment in the North poses for us, and obviously the member is right in identifying the issue of skills. Skills are of critical importance, and that means that we have to uh, ensure that the educational uh, establishments are well equipped and, and well enough funded to ensure that we have the output that can meet the needs of uh, those companies. And obviously, the, the other point that I made earlier is hugely significant. I think a, a very clear declaration of our intent to do something about this is the amalgamation of Dell and Deddy into a Department of the Economy. I call Danny Kennedy. Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, can I ask Deputy First Minister, given the uncertainty of the outcome uh, of the Irish uh, general election uh, in the Republic of Ireland and the fact that we are now in the dying days of the Obama administration in Washington, what is the likelihood of, of meaningful engagement uh, uh, with the uh, uh, American administration around St. Patrick's Day? Well, uh, the member obviously mentioned the, uh, the election uh, south of the border. And, uh, of course, I'm delighted that uh, our party performed very well with an increase in our vote of uh, something like 50 per cent and a whole new batch of young TDs. And particularly delighted that uh, there's quite a number of women uh, amongst them. So in terms of a government being formed in the, in the South, it's, it's my sense that th th probably this will probably be a lengthy process uh, with a government not formed until sometime after Easter. Uh, my sense is that it's going to be some sort of an arrangement between uh, Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil, either a grand coalition or a willingness of Fianna Fáil to support a minority uh, Fine Gael government. Uh, it's still very unknown uh, to all of us how this is going to work out in the, the period ahead. So obviously that's uh, a scenario that impacts on all of us, but no doubt the Taoiseach will be travelling to the United States and uh, the First Minister and I our meeting with uh, President Obama, uh, and obviously we'll have a conversation with the Taoiseach while we're there. The, the U.S. is of huge importance to all of us, and I think there's not a party in this House that doesn't accept that, given the amount of support that we have received over many years. They have been absolutely invaluable, both in terms of the peace process and also in terms of how we can uh, uh, develop our economy in a way that delivers uh, benefits uh, to our people. So, Hugely significant, but I don't think President Obama, uh, leaving the, uh, the White House, as he will do at the end of the year, will change the American attitude to the North. I think they will retain that interest, uh, whether it be uh, second, uh, well, former Secretary of State Clinton in the White House as President, or, uh, God forbid, Donald Trump. <laughs> Question number five is being withdrawn. I call Karen McEvitt. Question six. Uh, the current uh, junior ministers in OFM DFM will cease to hold office on the 5th of May, the date of the Assembly election. No decisions have yet been taken about the appointment of junior ministers to the future executive office or to any other department following the planned restructuring. Such decisions will be informed by an assessment of the responsibilities and business needs of uh, each minister. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, can I ask the Minister, does he anticipate that the role of the junior minister uh, will change or evolve uh, within the department? Well, I, I think that uh, given that in the course of the decisions that we took 
regarding the Fresh Start Agreement and the reduction in the number of departments and also the uh, number of areas of responsibility which we have effectively given over to other new departments, then we will have to give very serious consideration, first and foremost, uh, to whether or not we need junior ministers in the Executive Office or whether or not uh, junior ministers might be better employed supporting bigger departments, like for example the Department of Health or the Department of the Economy. But this is really uh, something that will have to be considered over the course of the next while. And of course the duty and the responsibility to finalise uh, an approach on how we utilise uh, the presence or other ways of junior ministers uh, will fall to whoever has responsibility to take uh, the ex executive forward in the aftermath of the Assembly elections. And that is the end of our period for listed questions. And so we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. S Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Deputy First Minister, he talked quite a bit about international trade missions. Any plans within the executive, or much discussion in the executive, in terms of trade missions near home, particularly in Great Britain and in Europe? Well, I mean, I, I think we're, we're always uh, very focused, uh, particularly through INVEST and through the work of the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment, to engage everywhere with uh, all of those who uh, potentially are interested in trading with us. Obviously, uh, and it's back the whole debate around Brexit, the, the, the amount of trade that takes place between this part of the world and Europe is uh, you know, absolutely phenomenal. So the work that uh, we're involved in obviously centres around our office in, in, in Brussels. I mean, we have opened a new bureau about a year ago in, uh, in Beijing, in, in China, and of course the bureau in Washington works uh, consistently on our behalf uh, and are very connected to Invest NI in terms of uh, their trade missions. So this work is ongoing all the time, and Invest is very much involved in ensuring that uh, wherever there are opportunities, whether it be in, in Britain, or in Europe, the United States, the Far East, or China, that, uh, that we have uh, the ability to move at, at very quick notice to ensure that we take advantage of whatever opportunities there are. I call Sean Rogers for supplement. Could I thank, thank you for that answer? And, partic and particularly with the, the, the visit of the Prime Minister last week and, and um, his failure to acknowledge the, that the 23rd of June wasn't a great time for a referendum. Has the OFM, DFM have, have there any plans to meet the Prime Minister to, to discuss the, um, the deal he got out of Europe? Well, I, you know, I think that the, the deal, in inverted commas, uh, obviously has been put out there by the British Prime Minister. Uh, the, the die is cast, and I think that uh, quite clearly there is going to be a public debate about this over the course of the next while. And uh, I, I don't know what the opinion polls are saying uh, about how narrow the vote is between in or out, but going back to your, your colleague's uh, uh, original uh, question to me, uh, uh, Emily Atwood, I think he, he makes a fair point when he says that in the context of this being uh, a very close run thing, then the votes of people in Scotland and here in the north of Ireland are going to be very, very important. And that's why it, it's unavoidable now for us to, to, uh, to not have uh, a debate around uh, the issue of in or out. And I certainly think that from, from our perspective that those who will be arguing to stay in uh, will be making the case that as many people who subscribe to that, uh, to that agenda uh, should go out and vote for it. Likewise, res respecting the position of other parties, uh, an opposite argument uh, will, will be made. And at the end of the day, it will be a democratic decision of the people, but I hope it's a democratic decision to stay in, and I hope it is in big numbers. Question number two has been withdrawn. I call Ian McRae. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can the Deputy First Minister state how far his condemnation goes of the disgraceful attack at T-Ban Memorial over the weekend? 
Well, I was unaware that there was an attack, but uh, if that is the case, I would unreservedly condemn it. Uh, anybody uh, in our society who believe that they make any useful contribution towards, uh, towards a normal society, moving away from conflict, uh, anybody that's engaged in those sorts of activities are enemies of all of us, in my view. I call Ian McRae for supplementary. We've heard the Deputy First Minister's words of condemnation, and I believe that's rightly so. But will the Deputy First Minister outrightly condemn those people who took part in this disgraceful, murderous <coughs> attack against people in my constituency? And what steps will he take to ensure that long after this um, event 24 years ago, on the 17th of January, that those responsible are brought to justice? That, that brings us into the whole area of how we deal with the past and the legacy. And during the course of the Fresh Start negotiations, we made huge strides forward in terms of agreeing the mechanisms and structures uh, which will be required to deal with that. We obviously have a problem in relation to the whole issue of disclosure and the uh, British government's approach to disclosure. And I hope that the comments of the Secretary of State uh, made on a number of occasions over the course of the last uh, number of weeks that she believes that this can be resolved. I hope that is the case because I think that victims on all sides of the uh, community uh, deserve to see those institutions up and running and the menu of options uh, that many of them are seeking made available to them. I call Jim Alistair. Thank you. Does the Deputy First Minister intend, by way of example, to other IRA men to provide information to the Information Retrieval Commission when it's established? Well, that brings us back again to the negotiations that uh, uh, we participated in prior to Christmas and the huge progress that was made. There isn't much point in establishing uh, an organization like the ICIR or the uh, other organizations that we agreed in terms of the structures if we're not going to encourage people to participate to ensure that uh, families who have been victims of the conflict uh, can get uh, some resolution to the, uh, I, I suppose, the information that they're seeking. I call Jim Alistair for supplementary. Well, if that's so, perhaps then the Deputy First Minister would answer the question. Will he, as an officer commanding in the IRA, lead by example and give information to the Information Retrieval Commission if it's to afford any hope to the in many innocent victims of his IRA? Well, I think that on a number of occasions in the past, I, I made it clear, first of all, that Sinn Féin policy was to argue for the establishment of uh, an independent international truth commission. And uh, obviously, we didn't achieve that. But what we have uh, done is that we have compromised in terms of the structures and mechanisms that we agreed prior to Christmas. I further make the point that there isn't much point in establishing those if people are not prepared to go forward. Uh, if, if I am required to go forward uh, on any point of relevance to myself, I am absolutely willing to do that. Order, order. Conor Murphy is not in his place. I call Barry McElduff. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister if he and or his office share the serious concerns of very many people who live in the Greencastle, Ruski, Gortian area of County Tyrone regarding a proposal to locate a cyanide processing plant at the heart of their community in the Greencastle area? Well, as, as the member knows, I, I am very aware of the deep and genuinely held concerns shared by many people regarding the potential environmental impacts to the locality, particularly in regards to the use of cyanide to extract gold from ore mined in the Sperrin Mountains in a proposed processing plant. Uh, although this issue has not come before the executive, it is clear that these concerns need to be fully addressed in a full, open and inclusive way and involving all the communities affected in terms of any potential community, environmental 
or health implications for the area? Barney McElduff for something. Okay, uh, Gordon, I got to thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. Can I ask uh, the Deputy First Minister what engagement he has had or will have with the community, uh, indeed contact that his office may have with the community in the Greencastle Ruski Gorton area regarding this issue? And just to note that there is a very serious concern about impact on public health and environment generally. Well, I, I was very pleased to meet personally with representatives of the local communities, uh, which included a meeting on the 15th of February. And having spoken with them, I, I have no doubt, no doubt whatsoever about their concerns and that they are genuine and that they are motivated by the best interests of their communities. So I think, obviously, this has uh, developed into uh, uh, a neuralgic issue for the local community. And I think what we have to do is ensure that the interests of, of local communities are protected, particularly whenever concerns are raised about the use of materials that could be detrimental to, to not just the uh, environment but to people's health. I call Craig, Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can the uh, Deputy First Minister outline the likely progress on the panel on paramilitarism? Uh, over the course of the next few months? Well, the, the First Minister and I uh, met with the panel uh, just a, a few weeks ago, and uh, they are effectively beginning their work. They've already touched base with a number of key uh, sectors uh, and stakeholders, and I think that uh, obviously we'll be looking forward to receive uh, their report whenever their work is completed. So they're now effectively up and running. Uh, we wholeheartedly support the work that they are involved in, and we hope that it will bring uh, to the fore what is, I think, an important debate, and that is for whatever armed organisations that are out there to recognise that they make no contribution whatsoever to our society, uh, other than a detrimental one. And what we need to see coming out of their report is obviously uh, something that will be a further encouragement to those groups who, uh, in a very foolish and misguided way, think that they can uh, destroy these institutions and effectively plunge us back to the past. That, that's not an agenda that the First Minister and I have any intention whatsoever of kowtowing to. Colonel Gregory Campbell. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Deputy First Minister refers to detrimental contributions by paramilitarism. Well, then, would he not agree with me that that has always been the case? And every time that I and others have indicated to him about his involvement in the past in paramilitary groups, which was equally detrimental, that it doesn't hold much water when he denied every single involvement or knowledge of every single incident that has ever been mentioned to him which leaves people with the conclusion that he was the most over-promoted 2IC in paramilitary history ever in the history of the world? Isn't it, isn't it just as well for all of the people out there that we represent that uh, I am not as bitter mm. as the member who has just spoken? That's right. uh, I spent a year in the office of First and Deputy First Minister with Ian Paisley, during which time we built up not just a good working relationship, but a friendship that lasted until the day he died. And we had many conversations about many things. And I know the member held the Reverend Ian Paisley in a very high regard. But in all of the conversations that Ian Paisley and I had, never once did we recriminate about anything. Not once. And in, in the eight years that I worked with Peter Robinson in the office of the First and Deputy First Minister, all we were interested in was making this place work making the executive work, delivering for our people, getting jobs, trying to improve people's lifestyles, and standing together against the activities of those who would plunge us back in the past. I just think it's a pity, I just think it's a pity that we still have small-minded MLAs in this assembly, and uh, one of them uh, has just spoken, and uh, another one spoke just a very short time ago. Fortunately for all of us in the assembly, the vast majority of people are not like that. Order. Order. Que <coughs> Question 8 has been withdrawn. Uh, 
Mr McNary is not in his place. I call John McAllister. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, given the, I'm sure the Deputy First Minister will be keen to have as much contact with the incoming Irish Government. Does he actually think we might need to uh, export the Dehaun process to, for them to be able to populate a government? Well, isn't it interesting that our institutions here are the most stable institutions on the island uh, at the moment? And I, I think that uh, I, I heard, I, I, I heard, I heard uh, over the course of the weekend a number of uh, radio interviews. Uh, a number of people actually make the same proposition that uh, the member for South Down has just made. No, I think obviously. Uh, the political landscape in the South has changed. Uh, they're going into this election, we were the fourth largest political party. We're now the third largest political party with a whole batch of new uh, TDs. But that, ha that has to be used sensibly. But it is, it is my sense that uh, we are going to see a government formed probably sometime uh, around uh, Easter time or after. And uh, if that is the case, then it certainly appears to me at this stage that it's shaping up to be uh, the Fine Gael party and the Fianna Fáil party uh, coming together. Uh, and uh, that in itself uh, would represent a dramatic development given, for example, that for the first time in elections south of the border, both those parties recorded less than 50 per cent of the vote. So the landscape is changing fairly dramatically. And that is the end of this period of questions to the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. Could I ask members to take their ease for a few moments?